let's just get started. I think we're we're um, we're we're in it, and uh, we have a lot of people that are already joined. So um, it's really my pleasure to uh, to introduce and to have Emily Kramer here from Market One. Um, one of the like main newsletters that I follow as a marketer, it's a must follow. We'll put the links in the, in the chat. And, um, what prompted this is just me reading her, um, and, and teams, uh, a blog post, uh, our newsletter post on mapping the funnel and the importance of that. And then also some controversy around it. And so, um, I think that's maybe like a somewhat decent intro to, to hand things over to Emily to kind of expand upon that and to jump into some slides. And we'll talk about, we'll go through some slides for a few minutes here and want to keep it very interactive. So feel free to plug stuff into the chat and we'll have a, a Q&A for a good portion after. So with that, let me, uh, let me hand it over to Emily and, um, and we'll take it from there. Emily, go. Thanks, Kevin, for the intro. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate having you here and excited to do the live version of the newsletter I published a couple of months ago. I think that newsletter is now our second or third most popular. So uh, it obviously resonated and I haven't really like brought it to life in any talks before. So I'm excited to do that. And so let's dive in. Kevin's controlling my slides. So you might hear me tell him to change the slides as that goes. But um, anyway, that's me. That's my face. There I am. Um, you can go to the next one. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll briefly say about me. So um, Prior to doing what I'm doing now at Market One, I led marketing at a number of B2B startups. I typically was the first or second marketer when I joined companies. So I've been, you know, everywhere from seed funded as the first marketer to Series E as an executive um, and everything in between. Yeah, we can go back to my face. Why not? I there see go. it twice. <laughs> um, and uh, since then, I've been... Um, advising, consulting, and now mostly focused on investing through my fund with my business partner, Kathleen. And we invest in early stage companies and then help them build marketing. But we also create a bunch of content, teach courses for marketers on Maven, um, run some workshops, um, and write my newsletter. So um, kind of split my time between uh, managing a fund and working with companies and um, creating content and talking to marketers. So uh i've worked with hundreds maybe more you can go to the next one it's cool we can look right, at the instead of me i've worked with hundreds of companies over the past three years um so I've done a lot of pattern matching and seen a lot of problems so um let's dive in so um a lot of people say the marketing funnel is dead i really don't care if it's a marketing funnel or if it's growth loops or what the shape or if it's an hourglass or like at asana we used to say it was somewhat of like a bugle or like the, the like loop goes back around, whatever the shape is, it doesn't matter. The point here is that you need to map your prospect to customer to even expanded customers and, and then your customers basically evangelizing your product. You need to map that process. You need to have goalposts. The goalposts either are handoffs between teams, changes in messaging, changes in activities that you're doing. So you need to map this out. I'll call it a funnel. It's not really, it's, it's a weird shape. Um, map it out, define your goal point, goal posts, measure that with reports, both the number in each stage and the conversion rate and get alignment across teams and in your systems around this mapping. Um, so that's what I mean when I use the shorthand mapping the funnel. Um, you can go to the next one, Kevin. Mm -hmm. There we go. For people that read my newsletter um, and have talked to me, I use this analogy all the time because there's so many different buzzwords in marketing around what are all the different departments and teams and roles. And especially when I talk to founders and non-marketers who are doing something related to marketing or trying to, um, I use the analogy of fuel and engine. So it's just simpler than saying product marketing, content marketing, growth, et cetera. Fuel is all the things you create to add value to your audience. And engine is how you distribute those things out. So engine for people that like the specific marketing terms tends to be the growth marketing, marketing ops stuff. Things like communities straddle both things. They can sort of be an engine, but also help you create fuel. Um, and fuel is the product marketing content design, the words, the things you create, all that, the videos. Um, and so I often tell people that you wouldn't probably do a lot on the fuel side without knowing your positioning and hopefully without knowing some key points in your story. And the analogy I use is like positioning sort of is to this, the, the fuel side as mapping your funnel and prioritizing channels is to the engine side. 
So I think of this as a core foundational thing that all marketing teams should be doing, which is mapping the funnel. Like it's really hard to do a good job on all of these other things if you haven't mapped the funnel. Um, you can hit the next one. There we go. So why do you need to map your funnel? What do you do with it? Besides have a diagram with lots of different shapes and arrows, you'll have that for sure. You can look at it and admire your work. I do it in Figma or Fig Jam, but there's lots of other you know, tools you can use. And if that all scares you, you can probably even do it in slides or a spreadsheet, although I probably wouldn't recommend it. Um, and so what you do once you map this funnel, which we'll talk more about, is then you can plan your marketing activities by stage. You can say for each of these stages, what are we doing? What's our fuel? Going back to that analogy. And what's our engine for each of these stages? And it'll likely be different throughout the, throughout the different stages that you've set up. You can then actually set up your marketing automation tool, your CRM, all of your tools to have the right handoffs and to be super organized and knowing who is contacting who when and who owns each stage and all of that stuff. Lastly, um, or not lastly, there's two more. Um, you can then build proper full funnel report, reports that represent every stage and you can get on the same page across teams, which is perhaps one of the most overlooked benefits, but like one of the most important benefits of doing this is like you can get much more alignment across marketing, sales, customer success on, and even product depending on your business model. Um, across what's happening, across the prospect and customer journey. And without this, I don't know how you do that. Go to the next one. All right, there we go. I should have made a hand signal, Kevin. <laughs> there. There. Um, there we go. All nice. right, so um, it's good. I like pause because I tend to talk fast. It's a good thing. Um, so you can see these in um, the newsletter that I wrote, which I'm sure Danny will share in the chat. But um, this is like an example of what I'm talking about when I say map this out. Yours might look a little different. You might have different names. You might really accentuate that loop back around from your evangelist to awareness. This can look different ways, but essentially this is your funnel flow chart. This is your flow chart of how prospects and customers move through. You'll see, we go from awareness. We might separate out inbound and outbound leads, especially you know if you're doing sort of both, both activities. Uh, um, versus like some early stage companies are really just focused on outbound or really just focused on inbound. But you see all the handoffs here from qualified and I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on the phrase marketing qualified, I think we should stop using it, but qualified, whatever you call this, to sales qualified, which is really a human level of qualification to opportunity all the way through. But the importance of mapping this is really saying, well, which teams own each stage, which teams are communicating with customers at each stage, and what happens when people fall out of these stages. So you'll notice there's like a recycling bucket here. What, what happens when people fall out at each stage? You could have lots of different, you could have different things happen at different stages when people fall out. Um, so really not only indicating the primary path, but also the secondary uh, paths when people fall out. So this is a high level example, but this is kind of what I'm talking about when I say map out the goalposts, the different stages, and indicate in some way what's happening at each stage in terms of team ownership. Um, so I'll also, you can go to the next one. Um, your funnel's gonna look really different. Not, I mean, it looks the same, we have colored boxes, but your funnel is pretty different in a sales-led organization versus a product-led organization. And by product-led, I just mean you have a self-serve motion and people go into the product before talking to sales. And so in the product-led situation, the handoff is actually from marketing to product. And I actually see a lot of like dropped, um, dropped balls on the marketing side in that handoff between marketing and product where it's like, who really owns onboarding? And like, there's an onboarding flow in the product and there's emails, but they're not coordinated across the teams. And it's really messy in that handoff spot, which it's messy in the handoff spot from marketing to sales and a sales led business is messing from marketing to product. But I don't think people think of this as a handoff from marketing to product, but it is definitely a handoff and should be thought of as such. Um, and then what often gets confusing with product-led growth or self-serve motions is sometimes there's a sales assist and sometimes there's just a full self-serve path depending on if you're a large enterprise customer or a small business. And so it's important to map that out too and really differentiate what happens at those different stages, which leads me to what a hybrid go-to-market motion flowchart might look like. You can go to the next one. I think we have that one in here, let's hope. Yeah, so most businesses or most B2B businesses these days at some level of maturity have, and even really early on, have a hybrid motion. They have sales involved, 
and they have some sort of self-serve option, even if it's just a 14 day trial or something like that. So there's two motions. Your funnel map gets sort of much more complicated when that's the situation. And you need to make it clear when people are moving between these motions. When does someone move to a sales team, the sales team versus go to the free trial experience? When, if, if sales is talking to someone and they realize they're better for the self-serve motion, how do they get them back in that motion? Indicate all of this stuff. Um, so you're really mapping out when do these handoffs occur? When do the activities change? And when do they change back? So these are somewhat simplified on what this actually might look like. There's probably more lines in actuality, um, but this is a high level of how this might look. Um, cool. And then lastly, like you don't just need that diagram and you can try to map these activities onto those other flowcharts, but then your flowchart gets super messy. So I kind of think you need the flowchart. And then it's also really helpful on the marketing side and really across the board, across go, go to market to map um, your activities and all the things you're doing to more of a spreadsheet or a project management tool version of this, which is really saying what, what's the definition of each stage? What are the rules of engagement? And then you can also, and these can be, just to be clear, this doesn't all need to be in one table. You could have a separate table or have that on the flow chart, but you need to capture all of this information somewhere. And then really getting into the marketing stuff of, you know, what exactly is happening at each stage? What's the anchor content or the primary content or fuel at each stage? What are the high level metrics you're using to track these? How do I get those to each, how do I get to those reports? And then also, um, you know, what's the status? Are you actually like, we've never done anything from uh, marketing qualified or qualified to sales qualified. We need to do more here. What sort of the status or the priority and what are the next steps at each stage to improve conversion? So point here is you need the flow chart that really shows how this all works and how the handoffs all work and how to set this up in your uh, tech stack. But then it's also helpful to literally map activities to each of these stages as well. And typically a spreadsheet is better for that something similar to a spreadsheet. Cool. Um, so that was getting super tactical on kind of like, what do these things look like? But I think the general point, you can go, you can go to the next one. I think the general point here is you need to map this prospect to customer journey. You need to prioritize and map activities against it. And you need to know your key fuel or content at each stage and your key engine activities or growth activities at each stage, including who owns it. So, um, Super important exercise. I hope you all do something like this. Like I said, I teach courses to marketing leaders um, once a quarter and I've done that four times now. And I always ask people when I kind of get to the funnel section, who has this? And typically, and this is early in growth stage, typically only 25% of them say they do. And then of the 25% of them, it's like they made it to get their CRM or, or HubSpot or marketing automation implementation done. And then they never looked at it again and they don't use it as a prioritization tool. And so I think this is, I think you'll find that it's really successful when you do this. And I know a lot of you probably don't have it. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks Emily for that. And also for being like so efficient with slides. I don't uh, like 10 minutes or 12 minutes. I think that was like record time for getting through all these slides. So uh, I think I talk um, fast, you yeah. know, it's, just, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a bittersweet thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have a, I, I have my own questions queued up and, um, but also I don't want it to just be uh, me and you conversing. We have, uh, quite a lot of people here. So um, for folks that are that are tuning in, um, feel free to add a lot of questions into the chat here and we'll start servicing them um, as we go along. But uh, maybe I can selfishly start with some of my own questions. Um, sure. The, the first one uh, is kind of um, more along the lines of when, when uh, it's a, maybe a bit more of a spicy question of when people are saying the funnel's dead, like, where is that sentiment coming from? Where, what are, what do they uh, expect instead of having a funnel? Like, can you, can you kind of um, talk a little bit about, you know, where that controversy is coming from and why your, why funnels are so important, um, even regardless of shape, maybe? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of messy stuff that happens between stages, and as we've gotten more sophisticated, well, in some cases, in a lot of ways, we haven't gotten more sophisticated on attribution, but we've gotten more sophisticated in attribution. I think we recognize that maybe these journeys are not linear for most you know, future customers. The, journey, the journeys just aren't linear. There's tons of loops going on and there's tons of different things you can do and it's, it's fuzzy. Um, but that's definitely true. What happens in the stages is fuzzy. 
and um, there there are a lot of activities in 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 each stage that can contribute. Um, this isn't an attribution model. This is set up to know again the goals, regardless of if you think again if you think it's funnel shaped, if you think the funnel is dead, you need to know at what point does your messaging shift, does your engine or growth channel shift, and does ownership shift? And I think that setting goal posts that people can hit no matter kind of like how they got to that goalpost or how long it takes is really helpful for doing that. And also for measurement. Um, are those, are those goalposts like, so that you are making, making sure you're like meeting customers where they are in the journey. And like, I, I feel like if you yeah. don't have those different, like who owns what, at what stage of the journey, it's like, can be complete chaos. And that's probably what you're getting at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple of reasons for those goalposts. One is the chaos of like, everybody's emailing me at once. I think we've all gotten, Mm. crazy spam from companies at some times and then they like leave you in the dust when you're actually like onboarding and need help um so there's that piece of ownership which i think is like people get that um i think on the marketing side i think at certain points in the process however long again however long and how many activities it took you to get there the messaging needs to change when i don't know that this you know if sometimes i don't know what the problem is and i need to be made aware of like the problem usually there's some awareness of the problem and then I need to be aware, aware that there are solutions for this. And then I need to be aware that there's a specific solution, which is, you know, like in your case, it's common room. So I need to know common room exists. And then I need to know like why it's urgent that I get this now and how it's going to help me solve my pain points. And those messages are different. And also the way you reach people once you have their email address or you know who they are is different than when you don't. And when you're doing outbound, the message is a little different than when you're, say, on LinkedIn and communicating with them. So it's just really important to, like, have this granularity. So you're not just, like, flying blind when you're doing messaging. Of, like, what am I trying to say here? And trying and to that's speak to where everyone. that's kind of where this kind of, like, map or, like, where you have a spreadsheet or something to, like, yeah. say, like, here's, what, here's the rules of engagement per, like, call yeah. the, the, the spreadsheet kind of thing. And then I would even go a step further after I kind of make the core one for each segment that I might have. And this is, again, maybe as your early stage companies may not have this as well defined, but segments both in terms of like verticals or industries and also the place where segmentation really comes into play where you need different funnels is like small businesses versus enterprise because that's often where you might have like a self-serve versus sales motion. So like I make multiple of these. Yeah, um, another vector too that we've seen a lot is role. Like we have marketers, yes, yes. sales folks, community folks, like, and and they all care about different outcomes. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I'd include that in like vertical industry role, any mm -hmm. sort of quality, any sort of like qualitative segmentation like that, and then the sort of more the firmographic segmentation. I mean, I think what you're highlighting is just like how complex it can be, and like it's almost like you need to like make, make sense of like all these different parts of the customer journey. And like, if you're not doing that, then, you know, your customers are probably like, what the heck's going on? I don't know. <laughs> if the message isn't landing probably, yeah, or yeah. you're not doing yourself a service or the, you know, I think what happens when you don't have this is you just have gaps and you have gaps and overlaps. So I was saying with this, with the email, like a lot of times top of funnel, you're just getting like bombarded or, or even like mid funnel. And then again, like once you sign up and you're in onboarding, you don't get the information that you need. So you'll have gaps and overlaps, or you won't realize that you're overly communicating with one, you know, segment and under communicating with another. So it's really just like, you got to get a lay of the land because as soon as you start to, some of you may be saying, we're not doing anything in marketing yet. Well, maybe true, but as soon as you start, it can start to get really messy, really fast. And, um, I'm very much you know, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to no, ask how not. you know, like what the level of granularity to get to where it's like, okay, you know, how do you, um, I guess, I guess like a starting point is, is, is key, but it's like, how do you know where to draw the line between like mid market enterprise? If, if that's like the vector that you want to personalize things for versus like role, like, is there like a diminishing number of returns if there's only like, you know, five people coming in that are yeah, enterprise definitely, customers. Definitely. Yeah. Like you're planning for a primary path here. I think this is the other thing why people are like the funnel's dead. It's like there's so many different paths. But you're planning for these primary paths, but you know when you need to map it out differently when major things are changing at each of those like goalposts. Or if you need to like add a new goalpost. So again, I just very much think of it as like I gotta get people across this line. Like I gotta get them to fill out a form or I've got to get them to have a meeting, or I've got to get them in the product in PLG to, um, you know, invite three people or whatever it might be. Like, I've got to get these people over the line. And that helps me laser focus on what do I need to do specifically to get 
like thinking back more to Asana or PLG, like what do I do to get someone from one user in this product to three users interacting this product? It just helps me focus um, on that. So I think you know when you, when something different needs to happen. Um, so maybe I, like on that example, maybe I need to add in another stage, which is literally like the individual does something in the product. Like the individual in the Asana example adds a task or project. And then another goal post that says, three people are in there. And this is in conjunction with the product team. On the sales side, um, you know, maybe it's another qualification stage, maybe it's a different opportunity stage, but you know when something needs to change about what happens around these goal posts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, changing uh, or, or kind of diverging a little bit, um, I wonder if you could share, because we've been in the marketing game for a while and I feel like, you know, 10 years ago, the funnel was very different and very linear and like, with different vectors like product led or community led and all these things like how is the funnel how are you seeing the funnel changing um or being more complex um i wonder if you have any kind of thoughts on the trajectory of yeah how it's changed yeah it's way more complex which is all the more reason that you need to map it if you looked at the sales led funnel versus the hybrid funnel examples you don't need to pull them up but there this gets it's a lot it. more complicated and i don't have this here but i have a newsletter about go to market motions and how marketing is wildly different depending on your go-to-market motion. And it's like a spectrum of pure sales-led and self-serve. And it's like most people are in the middle right now. Like they're, or they want to be in the middle. They want to have, you know, sales-led with even a trial, like I said, or they want to have a uh, sales assist come in after you're in the product, or they want enterprise to go to sales and everybody else to go through a self-serve flow. And so um, what can often happen there is like, sending the wrong people to the wrong place or it's not clear messaging and prospects have no idea what's happening and they think they're getting a trial and then they have to go talk to someone and they're not expecting it. And so it becomes with the ability to have more complex and automated go to market motions plus humans in, in the process, the more complicated the handoffs are getting because you're handing off to the product and to sales and back again, and you've got to map that out or it's just going to be super confusing for prospects. Um, or even people that are in the product using it and trying to expand and they're going to go to someone that has a better experience. Yeah. I'm going to turn to the audience, but I think this question here cool. from Jack, uh, let's see if this works. Okay. So if I click, it'll highlight it. That's very cool. Um, nice function of sessions here. So, um, I think this is kind of like a related question of, you know, how the funnel is changing, especially with like a, uh, with a hybrid type motion. There's also all these like different channels that are emerging and coming on the scene. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on like where um, different channels are best for each stage of the funnel? Um, I know it's a hard question, so. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a massive <laughs> question, yeah. but I think one of the things that back to marketing is really different depending on your go-to-market go motion, whether that's sales-led, purely hybrid, self-serve, PLG, somewhere in the middle. Um, the first thing at the very top of the funnel is like you need to figure out what per what am I anticipating is coming from outbound? What do I anticipate it is coming from inbound? And also like, what do I anticipate is coming from referrals, partners, whatever that might be. I consider that sort of like ecosystem, like mm -hmm. other humans um, channel, whatever that might be. Um, but it's not that simple these days, top of funnel, because people might have already come to your website and then they're getting outbound too. So recognizing that it's complicated but you still need to figure out like what is the ideal mix. And typically you see that outbound is more common in sales led and not very common at all in sort of product led growth path. So I think it's sort of understanding like what's gonna work for my specific audience um, and for my specific go to market motion. So oftentimes people ignore both of those things and they just pick the channels that everybody else is using to check boxes mm -hmm. and they don't think what's my go to market motion and what's my audience. So it's hard for me to answer the question because I don't know that, you know, I, there's, you know, I can't answer that a hundred times, but what I can say is um, once you have someone's email address or once they're in your product or once you visited their website, the number of things you can do to target them specifically uh, is a lot higher. And when you can target someone specifically and personalize that a bit more, whether that's through outbound or whether that's through retargeting, if you're doing paid or whether that's, um, through what's happening on the website, um, once you have that information, you can and should get more personalized and target and target them. So it's kind of for me, it's like before and after I know who they are, the activities change and I have to do more catch all things before I know who they are. And that's using, you know, 
things like social and paid search and organic search. And then from there, you can do more things on the email and product um, retargeting side. So that's like I a think really another, generic answer, but yeah, no, it. I, it's another um, like topic for maybe another newsletter for you. It's just like, yeah. how do you identify the right audience and make sure that you're putting the right offer in front of that audience at like each stage? Because I feel like that is where, where people go too broad or, um, you know, marketing to me is like very simple and easy. It's just like, if you could, if you know the right audience and you put the right offer in front of them, like that's where the magic happens. And if you can yep. like kind of map that out at the right time. Easy. Yeah. 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 Here we go. It's a right um, audience, right time, right message, all of those things. And this is one tool to help you do that. And then there is the segmentation piece and understanding your audience, which is really, really important as well. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I have, I have, I have newsletters that dance around this, but not one that's as direct on that, but um one of their yeah i think this kind of like segues nicely into just you know you map out this funnel you're able to ideally track the conversion rate from one of these arrows to the next um how do you know like what's the best point of leverage or like how do you identify where you should focus your efforts on um is there like a heuristic or something you use for that when you're advising yeah a couple of things um i think there's the quantitative um, looking at conversion rates, looking how they're changing over time. And then, um, and, and looking at that and then deciding you can even, it's, it's an equation. Basically, if we increase this conversion rate, what do we think we can increase this conversion rate by? What does that do to revenue? Like you can do it that way. Um, and then there's also sort of the qualitative, where have we put a lot of energy and where have we not? Like, where have we kind of like, where are we seeing diminishing returns and where have we not spent any time on the funnel? And typically you're going to start what I see happen is people kind of start top of funnel and then they're like, Oh, we're spending all this time top of funnel, but people are just falling out when they get to either filling out a form or talking to sales or in the product. And so then you're like, we got to bounce back and sort of fix that. Cause we're just wasting all of this top of funnel. Um, all of these top of funnel leads we're, we're putting into the funnel and now we need to kind of like clean it up down funnel and then we can come back and step on the gas top of funnel. So I kind of see that like back and forth happen a lot. Like, let's fill the funnel. Oh, they're falling out. Let's fix the fallout. Okay. We're ready to go. Let's fill the top of the funnel, see something new. So I see that trend. The other thing on conversion rates is I think some of the mistake I see is people are looking at conversion rate as like one, they're looking at the all up conversion rate. And that is going to mask a whole bunch of problems. And so I typically tell people they need to slice and dice that, you know, down to the point where it's not statistically significant, which is like by source is a big one. And then, uh, so understanding by source where you have different problems what do you mean in the by funnel. What do you mean by source? Sorry, like source audience, would yeah. be like, yeah, they came inbound through search versus they were outbound versus they came inbound through uh, social, like they came through a talk that we did or an event we were at, like that's the source, where they came from yep. Um, yep. or what caused them to sort of qualify and get to that next step. So you want to be looking at conversion rate, not only all up, but also by source. You also, a big area I see problems is when I see a lot of issues in the handoff between marketing and sales, things get dropped because there's a lack of understanding of what's a quality lead and what's not. And there's debate on that. So anywhere there's a handoff, you're going to have problems. Like whenever there's two teams involved, it's just going to be harder because there's two teams working on it. And so whether that's between marketing and product in the onboarding flow and the product and the self-serve motion, wherever there's a handoff, it's confusing on who owns it. Like politics get involved no matter how hard you try not to. And it, and it, it's probably not the best it could be. So I, I often tell people focus on where there's handoffs. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another sort of pattern. So focus on where there are, hand, where there are handoffs, segment out your conversion rate because averages hide problems. Um, and the An other, yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's going to say another vector that I feel like is um, part of the equation. is like the entry point where it's like, if you're, if it's something's coming from LinkedIn, but they're downloading content versus like someone coming in organically and raising yes. their hand and requesting a demo, I feel like that also is a um, has very like a huge variance on what will convert further down the funnel. Huge, yeah. Huge. I was just talking to a company about this earlier today. Like understanding if I I usually just keep this really simple, whether it's request demo or something else. I'm like short form or long form. Like, did they come in on just like a lead capture form or did they actually request a demo? That's very different, and you can segment by that as well. Um, so just recognize that you should be looking at conversion rates. Step one, so many companies don't. They just look at like number and stage and like ignore the problems. 
conversion rates are so key, a huge lever for you. You can do two things. You can increase the number of the people come in the door or increase how many people get through it. And those are your lever levers. And so look at conversion rate, make sure you're segmenting that out. Um, and then watch out for the handoffs. And as you're saying, watch out for sort of levels of intent as well. And is balance back and forth, top of funnel, fix the, fix the leaks, fix, you know, then go back top of funnel, fix the leaks. Yeah. Is there like a, um, is there like a uh, ballpark, like for how many, cause I feel like your conversion rate can be really good, but you get five people, you know, in the top of funnel per week. So it's like, if that is the case, like the bigger swing is probably on the acquisition side, but like, yeah. how do you know, like what the right volume to focus on acquisition or to focus on like fixing a leaky bucket? Yeah. So something when we're talking about conversion rates and really get to this part where it's like, look for the swings. When you see like big swings, like this source is converting at this percent and this source or form they filled out is converting at this percent or even last month it was this and this month it was a lot lower. It's like, well, you kind of are learning by looking at the swings or looking at the standard deviations to get kind of technical like you're or looking at the outliers, you're kind of learning your upper and lower bound for each of these conversion rates. And I think that can be helpful too, to just say like, is there ability to move here? Like, am I converting, am I converting one sort of segment that I'm looking at just at, su at a much higher rate and how can I get others, you know, to that same place? So I kind of look for swings. Um, I think that's a helpful way to think about it. And if there aren't huge swings, like maybe you, you do need to spend more time top of funnel. Um, yeah. and is there like a, um, is there like a, uh, you know, I guess you're willing to accept some sense of decline in conversion by doing a new tactic as long as like the end goes up, like the volume goes up, but I'm sure like yes. you don't want to have a huge drop on, off a of conversion. So do you have any like thoughts around that? Yeah. My thought on that is that people are setting their KPIs or their OKRs or they're looking at metrics wrong where it's typically like, I need to hit this amount of pipeline, hopefully this amount of MQLs I have some issues with, or like this amount of web traffic and they just have the number and that's their goal. And like, I can hit a web, tra I can increase web traffic all day, but it might not be qualified people. I can increase MQLs all day. I just change the lead scoring criteria, but you <laughs> need, whenever you set, people always love that one. Um, like people literally do that. It's not me. Um, but uh, you can game MQLs all day. You can even, yeah, I won't get into like game and ship on this stuff, but um, that's a whole other topic. But um you now I just lost my train of thought thinking of all the ways you oh I, I know what I was trying to say when you're setting a goal that's a number you need to have a conversion rate threshold on it let me give you an example this is like one of my pet peeves and things I always say it's like I'm trying to drive this amount of people filling out the request demo form which is not a subjective measure that convert to either revenue or opportunities at x percent so I'm trying to drive 200 people that convert to, you know, revenue, like 10% of them convert and have that threshold. So when you increase it, you don't dramatically de decrease, or you can have the number in that later stage of the funnel. Like I want to grow top of funnel to this, and I wanted to drive this amount of revenue. You need to have a threshold. So you check yourself and don't just increase it and have it not matter at all. I, I have to ask another follow-up question to that. Um, yeah. Even though I want to turn to audience questions, but is that is, is the way to best way to do that, or is like a way to do that to to set the right criteria for a qualified lead, like a marketing qualified lead or a QL? Because like if if you set that right criteria, theoretically, it's like that'll convert down the funnel at the right at the same percentage if you are doing it the right way versus um, uh, versus like looking maybe like. Uh, I guess I guess a way of answer asking this is like is a QL QL or like what's the right point to set the right criteria? When you're doing so, okay, so there's there's the lead scoring piece, and then there's just like should we be looking at this? This is a loaded question, but I think you and people would disagree with me here, but I think you know that you're doing qualification and lead scoring right when it's much more there's consistency between that and the next stage in your funnel. So when there's not like wild swings in the conversion rate from marketing qualified or qualification stage one to sales qualified or marketing qualified to opportunity, when those swings aren't huge, you know, you're qualifying, right? Because that's basically saying these are somewhat equal in my mind sales team, or like this automation is basically saying these are, you know, you should focus on these and it's never going to be perfect. Like there's always going to be, you know, some leads that are more quality, quality and more that aren't otherwise like, you'd probably be missing some if you had it perfectly mm -hmm. like that, but you kind of want to think of it as an equalizer. 
Um, like you need to pay attention to all of these. Like these are all, you know, have some level of quality and then you can open or close the floodgates as, yeah. as needed. It, yeah. I guess it kind of goes back to the, the source and entry point and other um, conversation, you know, like looking at, looking at the yeah. rate through all these different like vectors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So turning to the audience here, Joel asked a really great question um, that I might adapt a little bit to say like, there's, <laughs> Um, I think, you know, 10 years ago, it was like marketing qualified leads. These are the metrics that marketing is, is um, gold around. But then with product led and, um, you know, the different, different uh, trends in the customer buying journey, like there's a lot of different places where qualified leads can come from. So, mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you have any, uh, if you've seen like trends at, at what types of, um, like where to qualify leads and like, how do you make sense of like, the different uh, different sources or channels that are like outside of your purview, like a community or uh, like your product. Yeah, I think that. So, do you want me to focus more on like? Well, how just do like you. Yeah, I, I think I think marketing teams are or marketers are like, okay, how can we um, how can we get more insights to our. our hand hand more handoffs to our product team or our sales team and that mm -hmm. could come from like a lot of different sources yeah. um and so like what are some areas that people are i guess it's more like a joel's question like what are some things that people are yeah. going into to like drive that those qualified leads that are just outside the norm yeah so a uh, bunch of things here so i think one i think of marketing as a full funnel should be full funnel focused. And what I mean by that is you should be focused on driving qualified leads. But if you only did that, you'd be behaving a lot like a sales team where you're really focused on short-term revenue. And there's, it's good that there's a tension between sales in that they're focused on quarterly short-term revenue and marketing is focused on both short-term revenue, but also long-term revenue. And by that, I mean, filling the funnel for the future. If there's no effort on that, like you're, you're not going to grow. Like you need to build a funnel for the future as well as so when someone is ready to buy, you're top of mind and then also drive qualified leads. So I think the way you measure that and reflect that in the things that you're doing is you're looking at inbound and how many literally like, I like to look at more things that are less debatable, like qualified leads in a lot of ways, which I was kind of hinting at before, but mm. I, you need to look at request demo forms. You need to look at forms overall. You need to look at things like web traffic and you need to look at conversion rates throughout the funnel because if marketing is doing their job and this is a little, again, fuzzier because there's lots of things that contribute to this. But if marketing is doing their job, conversion rates throughout the entire funnel are getting better because more people are aware and excited about your specific solution and think of you as the option and are therefore converting throughout the funnel faster. There's like less need for messaging throughout the funnel because they're already sold on your product or they're moving through faster or you've created efficiencies where they can get through each stage faster through automation or self-serve or whatever that is. So I think if marketing is done right, you're improving conversion rates throughout the entire funnel. You're driving sort of top of funnel awareness, which can be measured a lot by even basic things like new user sessions. And then you're also looking at how many demos are being requested or people are signing up for the product and the conversion rate from that to revenue or the pipeline created from that specifically. So I think you need to measure more than just that qualified stage. And I think that's what's changing to reflect all these activities. The other thing you need to look at in Salesforce, it's called campaign influenced. You're looking mm. at like, you're setting up campaigns for everything you're doing and then looking at how that influences revenue. And when you add up campaign influence, it doesn't add to a hundred. Uh, so like, it's not mutually exclusive, like multiple campaigns can influence revenue. And so to, to evaluate the viability of a campaign, you're potentially looking at influence, but you need to look at it over a long period of time because it might take a while in recognizing that. So um, measuring marketing is becoming, it always probably should have been this complicated, but we, we have more ways to do it now. And we're doing, there's more different, there's more channels and more things that we're doing. And you need to measure the effectiveness of things on that campaign level, on the full funnel conversion level and on sort of, you know, driving demos or signups. So I know that sounds complicated and it is, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well because you went down that route i guess i had to go go here uh to, to touch on a hot topic of attribution and yeah um with with the salesforce campaigns i know that that is like a touchy thing is it influenced or is it first touch or last touch or um you know is there 
you know, I guess, I guess one way of framing this question is like, uh, how should people start? And then like, what should they evolve to? Because I know it's like a progression over time with like who gets credit for what and how do you attribute and make sure you're making the right kind of um, decisions. Yeah. From, yeah. So the who gets credit for what is why I think that um, the phrase marketing qualified lead should go away because it's not marketing that's qualifying them. That's an automated qualification process. So that's an like mm -hmm. you're using lead scoring or they filled out a form. It's automated. It's not a human. And sales qualified is really a human has then said this is qualified or they've booked a meeting or however you're defining it. So it's really automated qualified and and human qualified. You could call it AQL and HQL. You can call it qualified <laughs> one and qualified two. Because when you start putting marketing on it, ev everything gets like political. And it's like, well, marketing didn't qualify this lead. We reached out to them. It's, it's not the point. It's like qualification one, they have some level that we think they could be a viable customer. And sales qualified is like, they could actually be a customer now. And so I think of it as automated and human. And that kind of helps a lot with some of these, like who gets credit? Because mm -hmm. more often than not, marketing isn't being commissioned. Like it doesn't have a quota. Sometimes they do more and more. I'm seeing that. But like, marketing doesn't care as much like about like they they should care about driving revenue no matter and what's going to be best for the business and and so should go to market overall like what's going to drive the most revenue how can we do that most efficiently we're all like, on the that's same how team it work. Yeah. <laughs> we're all on the same team and especially because marketing is not getting like not really getting a commission or sometimes they are but like not always and so it's not as big of a piece of their comp i should say so like we're all trying to drive revenue and do it most efficiently and you should be incentivizing that behavior so i think incentive structures are often off because that's what you're trying to drive. And then I think back to the original question on just like, well, what are you looking at and what are you doing first? It depends on if you're primarily sales led or self-serve. If you're primarily sales led, first touch isn't gonna work. Um, or if you're doing a lot of outbound, first touch isn't going to work because the first touch is often just going to be like, I pulled it from Apollo or I pulled it you from- did, yeah, you, you grabbed a list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I, in, in a sales-led motion, if you have a sales-led motion, it should be because you have sort of a finite and knowable TAM that you're then like spear fishing. I need to, I need to come up with an example or a term for this that isn't about like killing animals because it's also <laughs> like shooting fish in a barrel. But if you have a sales-led motion, it be, should be because you very much know who these people are and they require a more complex sales process. And therefore outbound should be a part of that mix. And when you're doing outbound, you should literally be able to load like most of your, most of the accounts you're targeting into your CRM from the start and know who everyone is. So first touch is just always going to look like it's outbound, it's, it's sales, it's prospecting. And that's false because after that they could come to an event or come to a webinar and like that's marketing hosted. And so that's not going to work. Um, in mainly inbound driven motions, where people are coming to your website and then converting through a form and there's not a lot of outbound going on, first touch is a more viable thing to look at. Um, so it's more viable. I think it's important to look at, um, to look at all of, in the absence of like complicated, um, complicated attribution systems, a lot, which a lot of early and growth stage companies can't get to and often just confuse the issue. I recommend in inbound focused businesses looking at first touch, looking at last touch at qualified or marketing qualified or qualified one um, and looking at influence. You're looking at all three things at different mm -hmm. times and you're what monitoring about, all three things. What about, um, uh, what about like self-reported attribution? Um, actually I've seen a lot of that. Like, so for example, like people on this, this session right now, um, I guess they've opted in, but maybe they tuned in without registering for however reason. And then they come Magic. in through a Google search and then like convert. And, the, but, the, but in, in the, how they say they like found out about us was through this. So um, how, do you like suggest that people can like triangulate those things? Cause I think a lot of the, a lot of the actual conversion is outside of our visibility yeah. and tracking ability. I think, you know? I think that's overcomplicating it. Look, like yeah. we need to recognize as go to market professionals and as founders that search is at the end of the line. And so all of what's happening through search can't just be attributed to search. People weren't magically searching for that. And so this is where it's like looking at conversion rates and you can, and, and even conversion rates on, you know, if you're doing ads on those ads and things like that, like you need to not overly complicate it and recognize that some things are going to be undercounted because they're more top of funnel. And some things are going to be over, uh, over counted because it's, you know, search and it's always over accounted or outbound and it's always over counted. So let me just say for the record, search and outbound are always over counted. No matter what attribution system you have, they're always over counted. 
um, because there's so many other things that contribute to getting to that stage. And so like, I just try to recognize that and explain to people that if you turn off all your activities and just have search and outbound, I guarantee you, you'll see a decline. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unless your yeah. marketing yeah. efforts just suck. Yeah, but the outbound thing, the incentives are misaligned if you're getting credit for that because it would just be like download every single one of my target accounts and the contact records there. And then whenever they come in, I get credit because I source them through Apollo. I've worked at a company that did that and it wasn't great. <laughs> and that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, this question and questions like it got a good amount of, I, did, I just realized that there's these emoji features and you can see what kind of questions get upvoted. So um, I think this kind of like plays into um, like who owns what and um, is there is there ways, like as a, as a marketing team or like a, not not having the ability to change the product or to like dictate the sales mm-hmm. um, uh, rules of engagement. Like what can, what can marketing teams do to make sure you're we're holding other groups accountable? Again, it's like really focus on these handoff areas where there's like dual sort of ownership or a changing of hands, really focus on those areas and really try to get to, this can be depending on how the company is structured with goals. It can be sort of a shared goal or a shared responsibility to say, we're going to improve the conversion rate, even from like sales qualified to opportunity or from again, marketing qualified or qualified one, as I like to call it to sales qualified, we're going to work on improving this conversion rate together. Um, and really coming together and say, how are we going to make this better? Um, and like, it's not one team more than the others. I'm, I'm a big fan of like one person owning things. And that's like, drilled into me because that's was Asana's like big thing and literally how Asana is structured, like one assignee. But I think there are some cases where it can make sense to have like two owners for a goal and it's on these handoffs because it's like, this isn't my team or your team. It's like, we have to come together to improve this. Um, And I think it's in those areas of handoffs. So that's like a, I mean, I can spend forever talking about this, Mm -hmm. but like, that's what I would say is again, like focus on the handoffs because that's where the messes always are. Uh, I just saw this question from Jim, which is, I think is great. Like, what is the, if someone's an early stage startup, they want to get, yeah. they want to start mapping okay. the funnel. Like what's the minimum viable tech stack she use? Yeah. Uh, you need to have, uh, you need to have forms that aren't built on type form because it breaks all of your tracking. You need to be <laughs> using UTM codes and tracking that through. Um, you need to be measuring full funnel conversion. Um, and there's, lots of different ways to do that in tools but like basically it means you're going to need to have hubspot sooner rather than later like you can use alternatives but essentially you're going to need hubspot on the marketing side um to do a lot of these things successfully and then you're going to need to probably have at the early days no matter how many tools have tried to solve this problem you're going to have the spreadsheet that's the full funnel report that's coming from different places um so that's sort of the the basics and i think early on start simple like you're trying to get people to fill out a form either to sign up for your product or request a demo and just try to increase that month over month and increase the conversion rate to that month over month while you're also trying to increase top of funnel. And if you simply focus on, we're going to increase top of funnel every month, we're going to keep make the conversion rate better or the same to filling out that form. Um, we're going to get more form fills and that's going to lead to more revenue. Like you're in the right and you can do those things. Like that's where you start. Like don't worry as much about first touch, last touch, all of that stuff, because you're probably not doing that many activities early on. Um, and so mm-hmm. you probably know what's driving it or what's not. Yeah. Okay, I think we have just one last question and apologies cool. if I missed any. Uh, I know we're a little bit over, but probably have till the top of the hour. Um, this one came in that got a good amount of votes. So um, if you have multiple products or multiple different funnels, like do you suggest to map that or like how, how, would, you, how would you address this kind of complicated question? Yeah, that's sort of like another segmentation criteria, because I would imagine the reason when you know you need to make like sort of another funnel mapping, it's like different things are happening at each of, again, at each of the goalposts. So if you have a different product, I would imagine there might be a different way to sign up for that product. There might be a different different messaging. But I really think about it as, do you have multiple products that are entry points to getting into your product? Or do you have multiple products you're upselling to? Do you have multiple products that people are that are entry points, meaning what people are buying first, then you probably do. If you just have lots of different upsell paths, I would do a really good job at mapping out those upsell paths to different products or from different things. Um, Mm -hmm. So whether you're doing this by different product or different um, role in a company or different size company or some combination, it's really like, where are things most different? That's kind of how I think about that. Yeah, so you could kind of think of it as like, if you 
what's the foot in the door and then maybe focus on this like expand yeah. part of like separate yeah. kind of thing. I mean, oftentimes people don't even map that part of the funnel. And uh, maybe that's we're like, we got them good. No, forget about the it. Se- it's, it's really, an, I mean, if we're really getting time, it's really an hourglass, the bottom part of the hourglass is typically smaller. And it's like, what am I doing in that? When the, you know, in that bottom part of the hourglass, people need to map that out and with just as much rigor as you start to scale, um, as you do, marketing to sales and marketing should be helping customer success. If you have that team achieve, achieve the goals there. Cool. Okay. Well, let me stop sharing and just thank you. Uh, Thank you again, Emily. I think I learned a lot. I think a lot of people here learned a lot as well and appreciate all the. Yeah. And everything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think we were a little bit all over the map and it can sound really complicated, but at the very basic level, it's like, know your prospect to customer to customer expansion journey, map out the goalposts and know what you're trying to say, where you're saying it at each of those stages and try to measure it the best you can. And you'll be like off to the races. Like it doesn't need to be this really complicated diagram or this really complicated attribution model from at first, just start by knowing like, what are these goalposts? What's happening at each of them? Who's owning it? And you'll go from there. And my newsletter dives into a lot more details on this stuff. So check it out, newsletter.mkt1.com. Yeah, we'll throw it in. And, and if people want your help, uh, they can just go to mkt1.co and sign up. Are you booked That's right fine. now? Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, so my main focus right now is on the investing side and then teaching courses. So the best way to get help from me is to attend one of my courses. Those are on our events page. You can see all that stuff. There's both short workshops and long courses. Um, and we do, but the one thing we do sort of help with is recruiting. So if you're a candidate looking for a role, we have a form for that. If you're a company looking for help on the recruiting side, we do still do some help there as well. And so those are the primary ways. Join a course. Tell us if you're looking for a job. Tell us if you're hiring a marketer and need help that's not from an executive recruiter. And if you are a founder raising money, we invest. And I think those are all the things I'm doing. Read the newsletter. We're launching a community this fall. And that's all I got. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks, everyone else. And, Thanks uh, for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, appreciate it. Hope it was helpful. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.